Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Now, even the first covenant, so that's the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses at uh, Mount Sinai. That's what the first covenant means. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. And then we're going to talk about this thing called a tent, which was the tabernacle, which was a portable uh, temple, basically. For a tent, the tabernacle, was prepared, the first section, in which there was a lampstand and the table of the bread of the presence, and it is called the holy place, the first section. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, which was bread that, that the uh, Israel ate as they wandered around in the desert, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So those are the, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments that Moses was given, the famous Ten Commandments. Those were inside the Ark of the Covenant. Above it were cherubim, which are angels, of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But into the second section only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of all the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for this present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation, which is when Jesus came, which is what he's going to get into right now in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, so not the physical tent of the tabernacle, the perfect tent of Jesus' body, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Underline verse 12. He, Jesus entered, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, underline verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them, it's when Jesus died on the cross, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first old covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book or the, the scroll that, that they were reading from itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent, the, the, uh, the tent that they temporarily would set up, and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, underline verse 22, indeed, under the law, under the Old Testament law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified. Those are the pieces that are inside the tabernacle. With these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. 
For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Not uh, was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away all sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Woo-hoo! How are you doing? Wow. So understand that all we got done reading there was the aspect of how, listen, how people who are separated from God with their sin, how they can be joined to God again, how they can be, have their relationship repaired to God. In the Old Testament, God allowed a sacrificial system of, of animals to take the place of the sinner. An innocent animal died, so the sinner didn't have to die because then everybody just die. If Listen, listen, because some of us go, oh, that's kind of weird that God would allow animals to die. Well, understand this. If God doesn't allow some kind of substitute, then I have to die. And if every sinner has to die for their own sin, then there's nobody left in the world for God to have, a, have fellowship with. So watch how this works, ready? In case you're like, that's really weird. Understand that God, in his mercy, allows symbolically for another innocent animal to die for the sinner so the sinner doesn't have to die for himself. Everybody with me? That's why that system existed. So, listen, why don't we still do that? Why don't you mosey on up here with your cattle every Sunday and me being your high priest or whatever, uh, we sacrifice your animal and then you go home with your sins forgiven? Why don't we do that anymore? Why don't we have a tabernacle that we set up every, every week? Because Jesus has done all the work for us. That system, that old system, is no longer in place, is no longer in service to us because Jesus has been in service to us by dying on the cross. Everybody with me now? That's why we don't do that anymore. It served its purpose for a moment, but we don't do that anymore because Jesus has done that work. So let's look at it. Number one, Jesus is greater than the tabernacle. Jesus is greater than the tabernacle. And this is going to kind of, I'm going to break apart the tabernacle so you understand the parts of it and how it relates to Jesus this morning. How many of you guys have gone on a family vacation already this year? Anybody gone on a family vacation? Okay, so a few of us have. So um, I I got to go on a a vacation and uh, it was great. But one thing you realize when you're on a vacation or when you're, if you're a parent and you still have kids at home uh, when you're setting up your vacation, the one thing you've got to take into consideration is what are the kids going to do, right? So if you've got an infant or you've got a 17-year-old, it can kind of dictate where you're going to go on vacation. So if you've got all your kids out of the house, praise God, and they're out, you know, <laughs> in your empty nest. So that, that, that's a different way of thinking about your vacation because now mom and dad, we're going to Tahiti, we're going to get the... Uh, you know, the, the uh, little hut with the glass bottom that's over the water, and we're going to, you know, hang out. The problem is, is that if you bring little Johnny, who's two, you know he's going to scoot his naked butt across the glass, you know, or whatever. And it's like, you kind of go, gosh, are we gonna, I'm not going to bring Johnny. So, you know, or if you've got like 12 kids or whatever, you're like, I can't afford to take 12 kids to, you know, Tahiti. So many of us, we go, okay, what can I do with my kids based on how old they are and how many I've got? Many of us choose camping. Right? So we, we go, you know what's going to be cheap? I'm going to take the kids camping. So we, you know, we go get a campground or whatever, and uh, that's how we camped as a family when I was younger. Uh, and the, the funny part is when you get ready to camp with the family, you take them all to a spot, you get all your junk out, and the beauty of today is you can run down to Walmart or some camping you know, surplus place or whatever, and you can get a nice tent. And you can get the kind that have the fiberglass poles, you know, you just kind of ram it in there and everybody sets up a thing. And basically your tent's set up in like three minutes. 
But for those of us old people who remember the old school tents, where you, like the military type tents where you had like aluminum poles that had, you know, A had to go into, you know, M and, uh, you know, you put the canvas over it. I mean, it took like 38 years to set your tent up. Like your kids were already grown and, and out of the house by the time you got the, you know, the tent set up or whatever. So it's very similar actually to the tabernacle where the tabernacle was a hassle to set up. Uh, if, we, if we look back in the law where God gave all these requirements, there was, a, there was a people group from the tribe of Levi. So the men of the tribe of Levi were in charge of the tabernacle. And it was literally a, a traveling temple. It was a tent. And the way it would work is, okay, you got the uh, wood pole, so you're in charge of that. Get some guys together to do that. Uh, you're in charge of uh, making sure the ark uh, gets transported correctly and doesn't tip over. You got the animal skins uh, that's going to be the roof, blah, blah, blah. And so all the men were broken down into groups of taking care of this temple. So watch, when the, when the nation of Israel, the whole family of Israel, stops at a place, all these guys go to work, okay? But pull seven goes into three, goes into throw the, you know, tarp over. Is the ark in the right place? Okay, good. Is that, blah, 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 blah. They got to set up this portable tent, watch, so people can get their sins forgiven. This isn't you taking your family to the beach going, I, uh, we need a place to sleep, so we better throw this tent up. This is the fact that you aren't, you're not going to have a relationship with God unless your sins get forgiven. And so they would throw this whole elaborate tent up but after a while, it wore out because it's fabric and leather and wood and just physical stuff. So eventually, Jesus comes along and does away with the tabernacle. So we don't have to do a tabernacle anymore because Jesus' body has been sacrificed for all time that we don't have to set up a tent to get our sins forgiven because Jesus has forgiven them for us. That's why he is greater than even the tabernacle. So let's look at what the tabernacle was and how it relates to Christ. Plans for the tabernacle as a traveling temple for worship and sacrifice were given by God to Moses with the law. And we see that in Exodus 25. The structure was made of cloth, skins, like leather, and, uh, and wood, and measured 45 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet high in two sections. The first section was called the holy place, and it was 30 by 15, so it's almost the whole thing. And inside that, that room, it had three gold items. One was the bread of the uh, presence table, the lampstand or menorah, and the altar of incense. And the, all these three represented different aspects of fellowship with God. So here is a picture of a tabernacle. So, so this is a life-size scale of, of the kind of tabernacle that they would set up as Israel, Israel camped as a nation all around the tabernacle. Okay? And... Look at the wall or the fabric wall that's around this thing. I want you to notice something about it because everything about the tabernacle speaks about Jesus. If you'll notice, there's only one way in. There's only one gate. There's only one door. Jesus speaks of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one gets to the Father or gets into heaven except through me. Not through Buddha, not through atheism, not through uh, dancing around an oak tree, not through giving a bunch of money. You're not going to pay for your sin any other way. You have to come through me. There's no other way to get to God because sin is your issue, not that you don't think correctly. You have a sin issue, not a, not, a, not a bad thinking. So you don't need more information. You need transformation. And only in Jesus is there transformation. So you don't need religion. You don't need a religion. You need a relationship with God. And only in Jesus does he provide a relationship with God rather than him just going, yeah, just keep doing a bunch of more stuff. Because more stuff doesn't make you more like God. It just makes you more stuff. So Jesus says, forget the stuff. You need to trust me. Also, he says, I am the gate. He who enters through me, metaphorically, will find pasture, will find rest for their soul, for their mind. I am the gate. And in the tabernacle, it showed that there was only one way in to worship God. There's not multiple doors. You can't go in wherever you want. You couldn't even go in whenever you wanted. You would go in at a specific time and you had to go in the right way. And then you see a, a, an altar there for where the sacrifices were burned and, and the blood was uh, put in a, in a, in a little uh, bowl. And the priest would go and he'd wash his hands in that little uh, laver in the back there. And then he would actually enter the tabernacle, this fabric-covered tabernacle. 
And on, uh, when he entered there, there's three items in that front section called the holy place. The, the one over to the right is, is uh, the bread of the presence, and uh, the one to the left is the menorah, and then right in front of the back curtain is the altar of incense. So here's what the, the table looked like. It was a gold-covered co- table, and it had 12 um, uh, pieces of bread on it, and it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. This is amazing from this standpoint, that to this point in history, there was no way you could connect with God. Of all the religions in the world, how in the world did someone connect with their God? God was separated and invisible and out there, and even if there was a God, I don't even know if he cares about me. The bread of the presence indicated that God was willing to have fellowship. The priest would go in there and eat the bread in the presence of God. And so all the tribes represented by this bread right here would represent God's people. And it would be the priests eating and fellowshipping with God. And the other thing was the menorah. Inside of this tent, it's totally pitch black. And so you see the uh, seven candles there, and it provided light. And we also hear Jesus talking about himself as being the light of the world. You know, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the menorah was a way of saying, God, in God there is light. In, in drawing close to God, there is light. And ultimately, Jesus was that light. And then the third section, and the, the third piece there, was the altar of incense. This represented the prayers of God's people. And they would put uh, frankincense and all kinds of spices on top of those little plates. And they would burn it, and the, the smoke would fill this room. And the priest would take the prayers of God's people and some of the blood, and he would go behind this curtain... And inside this back section, there was the Ark of the Covenant where people's sins were actually forgiven. And we'll talk about that. But I want you to see that all of these pieces represent what Jesus has already done. That's why we don't need a tabernacle today. The second section, the most holy place, was 15 by 15 feet, and it contained the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat where God met man. The tabernacle was frail and temporary, but Jesus is strong and eternal. I want you to understand that God has done away with the physical because he's brought the eternal into our lives. And that's what we have in Christ. That's why none of these things we do anymore. I get, I get questions sometimes from people and they go, why don't we do this stuff anymore? Why is the old, uh, we've had people walk into the office going, hey, we should be following the Old Testament law. And I go, why would we do that? Have you never read the book of Galatians? And others. <laughs> I mean, the book of Hebrews, listen to me. So listen, the book of Hebrews, because you'll get this sometimes. In our area, there are churches, kind of some, sometimes just weird, weird, weirdo splinter groups that they'll say, oh, we got to follow the Old Testament law because this is the eternal thing for all time. And you can't, you can't uh, it's God's law, and so we have to follow it, and you've got to follow the thing. You know, we, we should be worshiping on Saturdays because that's the Sabbath. Um, we should be, you know, doing all these things. And I go, hang on, time out. If you don't have a priest from the, from the tribe of Levi, son of Aaron, you can't have any blood presented because they're the only people that can do it. That tribe and priesthood is gone. It doesn't even exist anymore. You need the right bulls and heifers to get your sins forgiven. Those don't even exist, the red heifer. You need a temple, which is, currently has a mosque on it in Israel, the Dome of the Rock. You need an Ark of the Covenant, which is, I don't know, anybody ever see uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? <laughs> it's in a government place. No, it's actually here. Who knew that the Ark was actually here in my office at the orchard? The point I'm making to you is the whole point of the Old Testament law was how God interacted with people. And the only way you could interact with God is if your sins were forgiven. Well, Jesus has done away with that by forgiving sin. Now we just follow Jesus. We don't follow the Old Testament law. Everybody with me? That's, that's why we don't do Old Testament law stuff anymore because Jesus has fulfilled all that. He's greater than the tabernacle. He's greater than that whole system. It's over. It's dead. It's done. God doesn't use it anymore. Because Jesus is here. Number two, Jesus is greater than conscience. And this might surprise you. This might be something you've never thought of before, but I really want to help you this morning. This might, this might be a life transformer for some of you. Um, I have a dog at home. And uh, I love my dog. 
He is a boxer, and I talk about him once in a while. When I talk about this particular aspect, he's a 100-pound, beefy, ADD, hypersocial dog. If you know anything about boxers, the breed of boxers, they are hypersocial. They want to be near you, but they want to be near you a lot and, and on you a lot. Problem with my dog is he's big for his breed and he has big jowls. And so he slobbers all the time. So you got to really love the boxer to, to put up with like shoelaces coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and he shakes his head and it just sticks to the wall. And so my wife, who is a homemaker deluxe, I mean, she just makes a fantastic home. It drives her insane. Because when we come home after leaving the dog in, we know exactly where Samson's been. We just look at the wall and there's just splotches of slobber on different things or on, on the couch or whatever. And my wife dutifully cleans up after that dog. Well, here's the thing with Samson. He has no conscience. He has no conscience at all. If he offends me, or does something wrong, or tears up something that I spent a lot of money on, I, I worked hard for, doesn't even bother him. I mean, he just goes, Shoo. he's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a cat, just totally worthless, right? <laughs> All right, no, I'm gonna start, I know I'm gonna get angry emails from cat people, <laughs> but let's just be straight. There's almost no point to a cat, right? I mean, <laughs> So at least with dogs, they're kind of they're dumb and, you know, you can train them or whatever. And Samson's very well trained. But at the, at the end of the day, dogs and cats and, and rodents and whatever else you have in your home, they have zero conscience. They don't care about you. They couldn't care less about you. If they have a different owner, they just kind of adapt to a different owner. And if you died or went away or got sick, they, they're not going to visit you in the hospital. They don't care. They couldn't care less. Sorry to break your heart. Your dogs and your cats, they just don't care. Why? Because they're different than you and me. How are they different? Because you have been given a spirit that is like the image of God. And how we are like the image of God is this. We have a moral nature that tells us right and wrong. How is that evident in your life? Even if you're an atheist and you go, I don't even believe God exists. The crazy part is that the God that actually made you put a conscience inside of you to tell you that things are wrong. Even if you don't even believe there's a God that tells you things are wrong. Here's how crazy the conscience is. Let's say there's something you want to do. It's something unethical. It's something you know is wrong. You know before you do it, don't steal that candle. Dude, that candle's sweet. In your heart, the lust of your heart for that candle is like, I'm going to get that candle. Now watch this. For an animal, for my dog slash your cat or whatever, they just go, I'm going to go grab this candle and chew on it or spit on it or whatever they're going to do. No conscience, none. They're driven by desire. Your desire says, I want that. Your conscience is so crazy it's you, but it's outside of you counseling you going, don't, don't. You're like, why is me telling me to not do something me wants to do? <laughs> if there ever is an evidence for the, for the sovereignty of God, it's a fact that you, can, you can't deny you have a conscience. It's why humanity has a justice system. It's why you and I have to, have to forgive one another. You've offended me, uh, you know, ask for forgiveness. We have to be forgiven and forgive. It doesn't happen for anything else except humanity. Why? Because you have a conscience. It tells you what's right and what's wrong. It's God's gift to you. Your conscience, watch this. How do you deal with your conscience? You only have a couple options, which is one, you medicate it away. You airplane glue huff it away. <laughs> You aerosol it away, you drink it away, you relationship it away, you always look for the next high because you want to be distracted, because you don't want to sit alone with yourself and go, I'm screwed up. Here's the point. You never can get rid of your conscience, one, because it's, it's you, because wherever you go, unfortunately, there you are, because you brought yourself. And the second thing is that because you have a conscience, how do you clean it? How do you, watch, offload the guilt of your sin? And that is something that you can never have an answer to unless God gives you that answer. Your conscience is uncleanable unless God cleans it. Your sin is unforgivable unless God forgives it. Our culture has many ways of dealing with a conscience, but none of them clean it. When I was a kid, I was a... Uh, 
I was germaphobic before that was cool. So when I was three, four years old, my mother tells me these stories where I love playing in the dirt. I was a typical boy, took my gun out on our 40 acres, shot things, brought things home, uh, threw dirt at people and cow dung or whatever, whatever I was messing with. I loved to be dirty. The problem was is I didn't like to eat after I had dirty hands. So I would come in and my mom would tell me these stories of I'd go, doity, doity, doity. And my mom would clean my hands before I came in and ate. So dirt had a place and eating had a place, but ne'er the twain shall ever meet. They would never go together. I would never eat dirty. To this day, I still have, to, I have a psychotic uh, thing of washing my hands before I eat. So it's easy, watch, it's easy to clean your skin. You know when your skin's clean. But how do you clean your conscience? Which, yeah, I might get sick if I don't clean my skin, but man, my conscience tortures me day and night. My conscience continually tells me I'm a failure. You failed. You couldn't stop looking at that woman. Why are you talking to that guy? It's not your husband. What are you doing? Can't you stop drinking? All you got to do is stop, put the bottle down. Why are you doing meth, man? Knock that off. You can't clean up your mouth, man. You, you just profanity just spews out of your mouth. Why are you so angry all the time? Dude, the minute somebody does something wrong, dude, you just go nuclear. Don't you have any self-control? That's your conscience. That's, your, that's God's gift to you going, hey, there's, there's things wrong. Let's repair it. Unfortunately, we don't take our conscience to God. We deal with it on our own. Or we don't deal with that at all. And let me tell you a scary reality. The scary reality is sometime, someday your conscience might not speak to you. The scary reality is that someday, if you continually abuse your conscience, eventually your conscience goes, I guess, we're, I guess we're done. And that's how psychopaths happen. That's how sociopaths happen. That's how people that look like they have no conscience and they kill children and kill other people and walk in and blow themselves up and whatever, because they've allowed themselves to, to be deceived into the idea that the conscience has just given up. And so let me... Let me help you in this area because this might be the most transforming thing you've ever heard. The way you get your conscience clean, the way you offload the guilt of your sin is to take it to Jesus and repent. Because in that moment when you go, Jesus, I can't live my life. I'm a failure in this area. Will you forgive me? Will you make me stronger in this area, in my weakness? Will you make me stronger? Will you lift me up? Jesus never fails to forgive your sin and to bear you up and give you strength. The amazing, um, listen, what I'm speaking of to you now couldn't be more applicable for the rest of your life because you're a human in the image of God who has a conscience. You can't clean it unless you bring it to Jesus. There is no religion that will clean your conscience because it's not about doing stuff. It's about getting right before God. And because God, watch, because God created your conscience, he's the only one that can clean it. And he will give you peace and rest. Instead of self-condemnation, you live in freedom before Christ. As opposed to the animal world, God built humans in his image with a moral compass, giving them direction in spiritual matters. Failure to live up to God's standard results in guilt and sin. The first covenant allowed sins to be forgiven by the death of innocent animals, but it never cleared the conscience even temporarily. The second covenant through Jesus allowed sins to be forgiven by the death of the innocent son of God and cleansed the conscience permanently. Look how beautiful this is. So if you're in Hebrews, turn back a couple books to the book of John. John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's just a couple books back towards the front of your Bible. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 verse 34. Underline this in your Bible if it's not underlined already because this, this is Jesus' words speaking directly to you and, your, and how you live your life. John 8, 34. Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a what? Is a slave to sin. Look at this. Everybody pay attention for a second because I'm going to drop some knowledge in, in your mind. You can say you love something. I love God. I love truth. I love whatever. But watch this. What you habit 
is what you love. What you habit is what you love. What is a joyful habit in your life is what you truly love. If you love making money and you continually have to make money and it's, it consumes your mind and you w- think about it from the minute you wake up to the minute you're, you're, you're asleep, you think about it during the weekends, you're like, I can't go to church, I can't take my family to church, I gotta sell this junk on eBay. What, you, what brings joy to your life in habit is what you truly love. Think about your habits. Think about the things you naturally default to. I eat all the time. And when I'm bored, I eat. I'm not even hungry. I don't even know why I'm stuffing my face with this food. And it's not a weight thing. It's not an overweight thing. You could be, you could be real skinny and be addicted to food. Because it's whatever is habitual in your life. I can't put my phone down. I gotta find out who liked my picture. Twitter loves me. I gotta bow down to the tweet. (laughs) Take an inventory. What you habit is what you love. Your habits reveal your heart. You can say you love something. You can say you love God, but if God isn't a habitual part of your life, then you don't really love God. You just love the idea of God. And here's how I do it in my life. Ready? From your pastor. I, I want to continually, in my mind, in my mind space, be continually repenting before God. God, I'm sorry about that. When, when, when God calls me on something on my conscience, I go, sorry, help me in that area. I don't go, ah, that's not a problem for me. I go, that's a problem for me, help. Because arrogance and pride goes, ah, that's a problem for other people. And that's, pride is the first step to destruction. So what you say is, what you don't say is, I don't have a problem with that. What you say is when your conscience goes, you have a problem with that, or you shouldn't do that, the first thing you do is go, yep, you're right. Jesus, help me in that area. Because that way you're not self-deceived, and you build a habit of seeking Christ. Build Build a mental habit of continually reaching out to Jesus in your mind. Your mental dialogue, your interior mental dialogue should always be reaching out to God. At work, when you're playing, whatever you're doing, continually be reaching out to God in your mind. Help me in this area, God. Because in that way, you build a habit of seeking Jesus. Look what Jesus says in verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Verse, 38, uh, verse 36, underline it. So if the son sets you free, you will be what? Free indeed. Isn't that amazing? You want to be free in your mind? You want to free your conscience? You want to clean your mind and your conscience and offload that guilt from years of perversion and just things that you go, not even God can forgive me of this stuff? You want to get rid of that? You bring it to Jesus. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. Don't self-condemn yourself. Let go of the old self. Let go of the old junk you did. Go, yeah, that was the old me, but not me now. Everybody with me? Let me help you. Speak life into yourself. Speak truth. Speak truth about God. God has forgiven me of that sin. I, oh yeah, you keep on bringing it back into my mind? I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna accept that. I'm a new creature now. God has set me free. Whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Number three, Jesus is greater than sacrifice. A continual relationship with God demands moral perfection. So while you're living, watch, while you're living, while your heart's beating, God suspends the judgment of your sin. While you're living, God suspends the judgment of your sin. But once you're dead, your fate is sealed. There's no purgatory. There's no nothing after dead. That's why the scripture speaks it's, it's given for men and women once to die and then judgment. You don't get second, third, 28th chances. You get this chance in this life, right now as I'm speaking, to accept the grace of God. God suspends the judgment of your sin, but post Post death, God demands requirement for your sin. So when you accept Jesus in this life, your sins are forgiven both for now and eternity. If you decide not to accept the forgiveness of Jesus in this life, you will suffer the consequences for your sin post death. Somebody has to pay for your sin. Jesus or you. It's, there's no other choice. So if you accept Jesus and forgive, he forgives your sin, you are now free for eternity from, from the judgment of your sin. Jesus is, great, is the greatest sacrifice. In the first covenant, God symbolically allowed the blood of animals to cleanse people and things because of their imperfections. 
In the second covenant, however, Jesus' blood redeems believers, making them perfect for all time, despite their imperfections. The ultimate sacrifice provides the ultimate forgiveness. Jesus has done away with sin for all time when you trust in him. And lastly, Jesus is greater than the ark. Jesus is greater than the ark. On the day of atonement, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the Ark of the Covenant to cover the people's sin. As God with man, Jesus made the Ark obsolete, for he was the perfect mediator as both the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice. Jesus has done all the work so believers can have all the benefit. Look at this, and I close with this. So if you're already thinking about lunch, come back to me. Ready? Watch how this works. In the Old Testament... They would kill an animal, they would catch its blood, but the animal really didn't forgive sin. It was just symbolically something had to die. They would give it to the high priest. The high priest would go through the first section and he would go into the second section and he would open the curtain once a year. The high priest, one guy, was allowed to access God. God would dwell between the cherubim here. And watch this. Inside this, the top is called the mercy seat. You want to know why it's called the mercy seat? Is because inside this, everybody be careful because I'm going to open this. Anybody remember what happened in the movie? If you're too young, don't look. Don't look. <laughs> so inside, of, inside, the, inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses. Watch. In the Ten Commandments was things like don't lie, don't covet, don't ha- commit adultery. Things that over your life, you're like, I can't even pull off 10 things. I can't even please God with 10 things. The law is inside here going, you're a failure. You can't even do 10 things right. But watch this. God, because he's so amazing, allows a thing called the mercy seat, which covered the law. And God dwelled here and allowed blood to be presented to him so that now a perfect God who should judge you for your sin now gives you grace. So Jesus is greater than the Ark of the Covenant because now his blood has forgiven people who come to him for all time forever. He now has made God who's perfect and imperfect us complete and perfect together through the blood of Jesus on the cross. That is why, my friends, if anybody ever finds the ark, you won't be scared to open it. Why? Why aren't you going to be scared to open the ark or even touch the ark when most people died when they touched this? There's no power here anymore because the purpose of this was to show people's sinfulness and their need for mercy. Now that Jesus has come, this thing's just a gold box if they ever find it. It's just going to be a relic. And by the way, if you happen to look up Google Images for the movie, um, this is actually made from the same molds. Fun fact, I happen to have one of the last uh, cherubim that were made from the molds that they made for the movie. And so anyway, that had nothing to do with anything spiritual. I thought I'd share that. (laughs) But I want to leave you with this, friends. Your conscience can be cleaned. God loves you so much. Jesus died on the cross to what? Repair imperfect us, the relationship that's broken between a perfect God and imperfect us. When you trust in him, you don't need blood of other animals. Jesus' blood covers your sin for all time, giving you a relationship with God that cleans your conscience and makes you right for forever when we trust in him.